Hello there and welcome once again to the PPM Restorium where I take project management principles and apply them to historical events. Today we've got a bit of a spicy one. It's not, I don't know why, spicy is probably the wrong word. It's, it's the 1904 Olympic Marathon. In 1904 the USA hosted their very first Olympics in St. Louis. St. Louis, St. Louis. And these were the third modern Olympic Games to take place since their reintroduction in 1896. Were there a success? Well, they were certainly something. I don't necessarily know if success is the correct word for it, but they let's say they were notable, especially as they were linked to the St. Louis World's Fair, which is also notable because it was a bit it was a bit very racist with a human they had a human zoo. I'm not comfortable talking about it, but as it's pertinent to the story, I guess I'm going to have to. For those who don't know, human zoos essentially took people from different ethnic backgrounds and made them exhibits and labeled them as exotic specimens. These human zoos were particularly popular during colonial times. Um, thankfully, not anymore. Now, if you follow the Summer Olympic Games, you'll know that the marathon is a major event and is actually the final competition. And in 1904, this was the case. However, it was very poorly organized, very terribly organized. It was awful. On the 30th of August, 1904, 32 men participated in the marathon, including 10 Greek runners who had never run a marathon before. Less than half of the athletes finished and uh, some of them nearly died. Essentially, that's uh, what I would call a disastrous marathon. Although, having never participated in a marathon, I'm not a subject matter expert, as it were. So if we imagine this marathon, or the Olympics at large, as a program, perhaps if they'd been using MSP, they may have had a slightly different outcome. Let's have a look at some of the main points. A big picture, plus a clear vision. A strategic viewpoint. Now, organising an international event like the Olympic marathon means you really need to pay attention to the big picture and have a clear vision. You can't just focus on the running spectacle. Instead, you need to consider a lot more. There's a lot more elements in play. How to attract athletes to the event and communicate with them. The timing of the event and the route. And the victor ceremony and who to invite. It's not just a matter of we need to organise a marathon and have a winner for the cameras. It's about having a strategy. Marathon runners need a strategy. And the marathon organisers also need a strategy. It's not just a buzzword. And you'll soon realise why we think the organisers in 1904 didn't necessarily have a good strategy. Or have a strategy at all. Learn from experience. Any programme manager knows that learning from experience is absolutely vital if you want to continue to improve and avoid previous mistakes. Now that's not too easy here considering that the St Louis Olympics were only the third in modern times. They don't have a lot to learn from. Clearly they had a lot to learn, but nowhere to learn it from. And the marathon itself had essentially been invented for the 1896 Olympics as the organisers wanted something spectacular that would be reminiscent of ancient Greece. They wanted to draw a crowd. In Greek mythology, this person, whose name I'm not going to try and pronounce, ran from Marathon to Athens to deliver news of the victory of the Battle of Marathon and then collapsed and died. It's a long way. So there's not too many Olympics to learn from. Nevertheless, that's not an excuse. The organisers could have easily looked at the 1900 Paris Marathon in order to avoid certain problems. Just the, the smallest bit of homework, just a tiny amount. Back then, the routes weren't really marked very well, which meant that a lot of people got lost, which is the last thing you want when you're tired and angry and frustrated and trying to run a long way. And the roads weren't closed off, which meant that there were cars, animals, pedestrians, all sorts of stuff running around the athletes that are trying to participate. It's not very Olympic to have a squirrel pass the finish line just as you do. Take some of the glory out of it. One American runner said he even got run down by a cyclist, which must have hurt. Both of them, I imagine. Basically, this means that the 1904 organisers should have been aware of the problems that can exist with an event like this and should have taken action to correct it, which they didn't. So shame on them. Shame, Bell. Shame. Focus on benefits. The main benefit of the St. Louis Marathon should have been drawing crowds, essentially selling tickets. But also, it had a reputational value. You want to be remembered for putting on a great event, not a disastrous one that some guy talks about in 100 years time on a YouTube channel. And while for the spectators, a lot of drama would have probably been exciting, I don't imagine that excitement would have translated to the organisers. It would be more stressful than anything. But they obviously didn't care too much about their reputational damage because there wasn't social media or prominent news media back then that would have caused what we would refer to today as a media sandstorm. 
We wouldn't say Sandstorm, but you know what we would say. Not only was that route not marked out very well, it also wasn't the best choice of route. A bit like with the previous Olympics in 1900. There were several hills and roads that weren't closed off, and the runners had to be careful not to be run over by wagons and trams and even trains. And the roads themselves were extremely dusty, which meant as the organisers rode in cars in front of the athletes, it created a giant dust storm, which isn't the best thing to have in your face when you're running, I don't imagine. I have literally no experience. We also have one of the first recorded instances of doping in a race of this nature, as one of the American favourites, Thomas Hicks, was given a cocktail of substances, including brandy and egg whites and this chemical here that, again, I can't pronounce and I'm not going to try. It helped him win the race, however, he wasn't in the best state when he did, as he had to be carried over the finish line and claimed he was hallucinating, which... I mean, he won, though. And it took about an hour for Hicks to even be well enough to leave the area after the race. He also lost around eight pounds in weight during the race, which some people would call a benefit, but I think in this circumstance, we can classify it as not a benefit. Manage risks. Now, this is an important one to consider when you're talking about something like the Olympics, because the risks range all the way from athletes getting injured to reputational damage on an international scale. You become the laughing stock of the UN. Unfortunately, in 1904, the organisers of the marathon weren't necessarily that invested in managing risks. They didn't care. They didn't care at all, it seems. I, I wasn't there in the room, but given the evidence, they did not care at all. Here are a few examples of things that could have been considered risks, but weren't, and thus turned into fairly major problems. The marathon itself was scheduled to be in the afternoon rather than in the morning, which meant temperatures had reached around 30 degrees Celsius, and due to the humidity, it actually felt and was perceived to be more like 57 degrees Celsius, which is, is a, hot, that's a hot day, especially to be running. In addition to that, runners also were only offered water once during the race, which in comparison to modern day, they're generally offered between 8 and 12 water stations during the race. So that's a lot less. And supposedly this was actually done deliberately as the organisers wanted to test the effects of dehydration, which we now know is, is not a great thing and maybe not an experiment to try at the Olympics. And going back to the dust clouds we were talking about earlier, one of the runners actually suffered from internal bleeding as the dust from the road damaged his stomach lining. Shouldn't have been eating it. Uh, he probably wasn't eating it. He wasn't. One runner gave up after he couldn't stop vomiting. Another one was chased a mile off route by a pack of dogs. It's, it's thoroughly unolympic. And another runner got stomach cramps after eating rotten apples and decided to take a nap. And he still finished fourth, amazingly. Essentially, there were almost no security protocols in comparison to the kind of ones you see today, or even in comparison to the 1900 Olympics. And therefore, we can safely assume that managing risks wasn't really a priority. Good stakeholder engagement. Good stakeholder engagement and clear communication is vital to delivering value and the intended benefits of an event like this. And this is actually really interesting when you look at the Olympics as a whole, because St. Louis wasn't even supposed to host the Olympics. Chicago actually won the bid. However, the organizers of the World's Fair weren't necessarily thrilled about having to compete with another international event. So essentially they behaved kind of like spoiled brats and said that they were going to host their own sporting event if it wasn't given to them, and eventually the bid was handed from Chicago to St. Louis. So they threw a tantrum and it worked, but not really great stakeholder engagement. And the same seems to have been going on with the marathon. The organisers really didn't seem to care all that much about their stakeholders. It doesn't seem like there was any interaction at all with the public or with the relevant authorities. A prime example would be going back to what we said about the roads not being closed and the runners having to avoid being run over by cars and wagons and a number of menagerie of dangers. And in addition, considering one of their most valuable and important stakeholders, there was no means by which they could communicate with the athletes in order to offer them support, which evidently they desperately needed. Cuban postman Ander in Carvajal experienced a legitimate odyssey trying to get to St. Louis. He'd lost all his money, he had to hitchhike, he hadn't eaten in 40 hours, which is why he went and ate rotten apples, as we talked about before, and he had to run in his street clothes, purely because there was no support offered to him from the organisers. There was no one he could have called, not even the Ghostbusters. 
However, one caveat has to be considered here, and that's that in 1904, they didn't have the same effective communication methods that we have today. Plus, there were a lot of tensions present due to the Russo-Japanese War. And as you can imagine, it wasn't particularly easy getting into the United States because there were no commercial flights at this point. So we say again that stakeholder engagement just either wasn't a priority or wasn't considered. And despite all the drama and all of the issues and the dodging buggies and the menagerie of creatures running around the track, they did in fact have a winner. But even the medal ceremony didn't go off without a hitch. President Roosevelt's daughter was actually present to hand over the medals. And this was the year they introduced the three medal structure that they still use now, bronze, silver, gold. However, she almost crowned as the winner a cheat, a guy who had spent most of the race in an automobile commonly known as a car, kind of undermines the value in a marathon. He himself claimed he was only joking when he almost accepted the gold medal. It's just a, it's a bad joke. Actually, it would have been a great joke. This event was so disastrous that the marathon was nearly abolished from future Olympics. Thankfully, it wasn't, and it's still the final event of every Summer Olympics today. And finally, the winner of the 1904 marathon, that is the person that did actually end up getting the gold medal, was Thomas Hicks, who is the person who we previously discussed as having a cocktail of substances in his system, and thus is a cheat. And that's all I have to say about the 1904 Summer Olympic Marathon and its relation to managing successful programs. If you enjoyed this video and you like this kind of content, please leave a like on the video and perhaps even subscribe to the Axos YouTube channel. We've got loads more exciting content upcoming, including a few live streams in the next month. So keep an eye out for those. Until then, see you next time.